here today and share with you a little bit about what God is doing around the world and uh, through Global Surge and our ministry in Metro Manila. I enjoyed my last visit with you last summer. It's a little colder here today. All right. Now, I, I grew up in Manila, as the video said. Man, those pictures were ancient. Man, I don't know who that guy was. That thin kid there lives inside of this great body. I'm going to say that, okay. And uh, uh, we live on a tropical island. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, how you can be involved in missions. Uh, and one of the big deals that I'm going to say is it's a great time to come on a missions trip to the tropics in January and February, okay? I mean, when it gets really cold, think about being a missionary. And then you can come on and be part of us. Uh, we, do, we are church planters in Metro Manila and throughout Asia. We base our ministry out of Metro Manila. And uh, God has given us just great favor. Uh, we've weathered through COVID and we've been able to find ways to pivot and reach people. And we have continued to see literally thousands of people come to know Jesus Christ in spite of the COVID pandemic, you know. Now I'm ready to be done with it, and I, you know, and things are uh, are moving better a little bit. We we had a church. Let me tell you a quick story by way of introduction. We had a church, our newest congregation, that launched in February of 2020. So that's two years ago, three weeks before the lockdown. Okay, and so this guy has been our pastor Rodno has been working on this church and developing small groups. He had 18 small groups that were in place, and he launched big. He launched with over 200 people and then three weeks later he was denied to meet he was not allowed to meet how do you how would you like to start a church and then get shut down like three weeks after you got started we had to help him out of depression so we gave him whatever we needed to get him up and uh and then he continued to work throughout the community with relief and winning people and 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 starting new small groups he came out of the out of the lockdown with about 35 small groups and he had his second anniversary two weeks ago with over 500 people present. I tell you what, you just can't stop the gospel. I'm going to say that. I mean, God is still on the throne. He is not surprised about what we've been through. It is part of his glorious plan. And all we need is believers to stand up and believe that God can do great things. And the message I'm going to bring to you today is out of 1 Samuel 17. So if you'll find that on your phone or tablet or Bible or however you look at the Bible, uh, we're going to talk about a very familiar story, David and Goliath. Now, the title of my message is Go Goliath or Go Home. Okay. David had faith that could conquer Goliath. And I believe that if we're going to reach our world with Jesus Christ today, we need to have the kind of faith that David had when he was just a teenager to believe that God could enable us to do anything. And that's how he lived his life. 1 Samuel 17, we're going to pick it up in verse 21. I'm going to read the passage with you. You're very familiar with it. It says, For Israel and the Philistines had drawn up in battle array, army against army, and David left his supplies in the hand of the supply keeper, ran to the army, and came and greeted his brothers. Verse 23, Then as he talked with them, there was a champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, coming up from the armies of the Philistines, and he spoke according to the same words so David heard them now what is happening here it is a battle one superpower against another superpower they have come to this field this battlefield and they have lined up and they're ready for a bloody encounter and Goliath the Philistine of Gath decides, is led by his generals, say, hey, let's not kill each other. Let's just have two people fight. This is our champion, and Goliath steps forth. Now, you know he's the giant, you know. I mean, everybody knows the story of David and Goliath. Whether you've been in church or not, it's been everywhere. And so, and so he comes out, and he defies the armies of Israel, and he basically says, my God is greater than your God. Send me some man to fight against me. And he taunts them. David shows up in that setting. Verse 24. 
And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were dreadfully afraid. Now, get, get a mindset. I know you've heard the story, so kind of walk back in time with me, all right? Imagine you're on the battlefield. You're smelling the smells of what's going on there, the dust, the armies that are there, the fear that you may not live another day when this battle proceeds. And this giant comes forth and says, send me somebody. The army of Israel was afraid, dreadfully afraid, the Bible says. They were, they were in abject fear. They didn't know who was going to fight Goliath. They were worried that whoever fought him would lose and that they would become the slaves of the Philistines. And this is the army that has won battle after battle. This is the same army generations before when the children of Israel crossed the Red Sea on dry ground and decimated the superpower of Egypt. They knew the story. The same army in their history that they walked up to Jericho and they marched around the walls and it fell and they conquered the land that they now dwell in. And here they find themselves believing in the same God, the same army, the same heritage that had come forth from this time and they are afraid. If you jump down... Uh, verse 25, so the men of Israel said, have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And it is said that the man who kills him, the king will enrich with great riches, will give him his daughter. That's not a bad deal. All right. And give his father's house exemption from taxes in Israel. Okay. That's the deal. I mean, everybody ought to jump on. All right. Then David spoke to the men who stood by him saying, what shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him in the same manner saying, so shall it be done for the man who kills him. Verse 29, and David said, excuse, let's go to verse 30. Then he turned from him, his brother, toward another and said the same thing. And these people answered him as the first one did. And now when the words of David spoke were heard, they were reported them to Saul and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. David had faith, even as a teenager in this setting, in the living God that had brought the children of Israel to this moment. It was the same God, the same power, but everybody else was afraid. Even the king was afraid, except for David. There are four things I see in David in this chapter. Four things about David's faith that I want you to grasp today. And the reason I come and talk to you about this is because it's going to take the faith of David to reach our world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Your pastor has laid, laid out a great challenge. He's thrown down the gauntlet. He said, let's do it. I believe that Anchorage Baptist Temple has the best years ahead of it, that the mission outreach of your church is just now beginning to flourish, and God is going to use you to do mighty things, but you're going to have to have the faith of David in order to accomplish this. The first thing that I see in the faith of David is this, see opportunity when others see danger. When David showed up at the battlefield, everybody was afraid of the giant Gath of Goliath and, and they, they just cowered in fear and they fled, the Bible says, they ran away. And day after day, as Goliath came forth and taunted the children of Israel, the armies of the living God, everybody cowered in fear except David. I remind you of this verse in Deuteronomy 20 and verse 1. When, you go, when thou goest out to battle against your enemies and see horses and chariots and people more than you, be not afraid of them, for the Lord thy God is with you, which brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And Deuteronomy reminds us and reminded them that it's the same God that brought them up out of Egypt that is with them today. And I'm here to say to you, it is the same God that stood with, Jay, with, with David on that battlefield that is standing with you this very moment. It's the same God. 
Some people, when they see danger or problems, they immediately shrink and cower. Isn't that right? They get afraid. They say it can't be done. I remember that uh, uh, years ago when we began our ministry reaching into the inner city young people of Metro Manila. So our camp ministry that we have developed uh, really went after the, the, the core lost people uh, of Metro Manila, the inner city young people. And I mentioned this the last time I was here that you have, you have like regular unbelievers and then you have the real unbelievers, okay? The real ones are the drug addicts the gangsters, you know, the alternative lifestyle people, the people that, that when, if they came in and sat beside you, you'd scoot over, okay? Or at least move your purse to the other side, all right? That kind of person, person that nobody wanted. And God had brought us uh, into a ministry where we were decided that we were gonna go after the very most difficult people to reach in our society. And that's who we went after. Now they were rough, they were gangs. I, now I, I love camp. I, we do a camps uh, in, in, in the Philippines, like a camp on steroids. We do an average of 90 camps a year, okay? I mean, 90% of the kids that come to camp are unbelievers. We've had thousands of kids saved at our camp. Over In the past 20 years, over 800,000 young people have come to know Jesus Christ through the camp ministry. <laughs> Lost kids. Now, we learned a secret. I'm going to tell you it right now, but don't spread it, okay? Because if everybody gets it, they'll, they'll start doing it all over the world. But we've learned that if you want to have a lot of people saved, you have to have a lot of unsaved people there. Okay, I know that, uh, that's, that's like rocket science, you know. So we figured if we want a lot of people saved, we got to have, have the room full of unbelievers. And so we did it. We, we went out on the streets, you know, and, and I, I would go out and recruit and, and uh, help kids come to, uh, come to camp. And they didn't even know what they were coming to. But we said, hey, it's going to be a lot of fun. You're going to have a lot of games. And yeah, we're going to talk about God. So, you know, but you, you'll enjoy it nevertheless. And, and we got them to come. I, you know, I remember one time, I love to be at the, the early times when the buses are loading with kids from the, the, the slum areas of Metro Manila, okay? Uh, the depressed area, that's a politically correct way to say it, okay? Uh, and we would go in, and I remember that I was at there one, it was at six o'clock in the morning, we were loading up the buses, and there was this group of gang guys that came, okay? Now, they had the right colors, you know, and they had the right, you know, the pants at the right level, and, you know, and they had the right swagger, and they knew all the signs of the fingers and everything like that. I knew nothing. I was just there helping them get on the bus. They're getting on the bus. I'm giving them high fives, bumping them, kicking, whatever I had to do to make them feel welcome. They get on the bus and I'm, I'm thinking in my heart, this is so cool. These guys have never heard the gospel. I mean, they're going to get a chance. I mean, seriously, they're going to get a chance to meet Jesus for the first time in their life. And I was pumped. As I was enjoying the moment of these kids getting on the bus, another group of kids come in and they had different colors on. They had the hats going the other way or something. I don't know what they did, you know, and they give different signs. And so I bumped them with my left arm or whatever I had to do to make them happy and get them on the bus. Three, four guys get on, they come back out. And I said, what's going on? They said, we can't ride on this bus. And I said, why? Oh, we don't like those guys. That's a different gang. We hate those guys. And I said, oh, no problem. I got another bus. So I marched them over to the other bus and put them on the other bus. And they were happy because they weren't on the same bus. Then when the bus left, I thought, they're going to the same camp. <laughs> I got on the phone. I said, hey, hey, give me security. Just telling you, you got two groups, bus number such and such and such and such, when they get off. And sure enough, they were opposing gigs. They were in their thing. And the first service that went through, they, they, they learned the system a little bit. They knew we'd do a, a, a music set, and then we'd go to a blackout, and then we'd go to a drama. And they learned that on the first series. So the second session came out, we went to music set, went to the blackout. And evidently, some gang guy looked at the other gang guy's girl in a, in a wrong way, and it got mad. And so a folding chair in the dark flies across the aisle hits three guys in the head, okay, in the dark. All I know is lights come up and 1,200 young people are rushing out of the pavilion. And we're like, what's going on? And there's a fight down front. It's a cool camp if you want to come, you know, when, that, when that's going on. And so, I, you know, I, I, I actually have a couple of pastors from the United States that they were there to see the camp and they were all unnerved. They thought, man, what's going to happen? I walked in, now we have, we have a group of guys called Tough Guys, it's our martial arts ministry in Metro Manila and they provide security, they're a bunch of black belts and so when this happens, they, they move in, kind of stop the fight. I decide to help, now I'm not a black belt, okay? But I can fall on somebody and break their leg, okay? <laughs> so I'm gonna help. 
And I get in there, and they're fighting, and I see this little piece of bamboo. It's about this long and about this, this thing. And I thought, man, someone's going to use that as a weapon. So I picked that up, and I'm trying to stop guys and everything. Evidently, I started waving the weapon. I didn't know what was going on. One of the black belts come up and says, Pastor Greg, can we have your weapon, please? You know. I'm like, yeah, it's just a piece of, I give him the bamboo or everything. By the way, the story, by the time it got back to Manila, that little piece of bamboo had grown to this long, this big, and I'd take it out two gang guys, okay? <laughs> Some stories you let run. You just let it go. You know, it, it helps your reputation. We put the, the, the service back together, and I decided to sit by the gang leader that started the fight. I saw an opportunity when others saw danger. And I sat by him and he says, so you're, you're like in charge of this thing. And I said, yeah. He says, you're going to kick me out of camp. And I said, no. I said, I just want to be your friend. I said, do you have a father? He looked at me and laughed, sneered at me and said, no. I said, well, maybe let me be your father today. He says, you want to be my father. I said, yeah, yeah, for today. Yeah, yeah. He says, are you going to buy me Cokes? Yeah, I'll buy you Cokes, buy soft drinks, whatever you want. He says, you going to buy all my friends Cokes? Sure, line them up, you know, i tell you what. You know, he says, then you can, you can sit here and be my father. I sat by him through the whole service, hoping and praying that when the gospel was shared, he'd be focused enough to turn to Jesus. And he did. You have to see opportunity when others see danger. David was like that. The second thing that David did, he trusted God's reputation, not his own ability. So let's go back to the story and let's pick it up. It says in verse uh, uh, 32, then David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with the Philistine. Saul says to David, you're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. You are a youth and he is a man of war from his youth. David said to Saul, your servant used, used to keep his father's sheep and when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. Okay, get the detail here. Delivered the lamb from the lion's mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear, he says. Now, I know we got hunters in the room, okay? This is a very cool hunter, okay? The lion comes and takes a lamb. David chases the lion down, takes the lamb out of the mouth of the lion. Okay, he's got his, he's got his weapon with him, his, his, his stick. And then when the lion growls because David took the lamb out, David puts the lamb down, walks over, grabs the lion, and clubs him to death. That's a hunter, I'm going to say, okay? <laughs> David said, I did that. I fought the lion and the bear. And he says in verse 36, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. David was not resting in his own abilities. He was referencing how God enabled him to overcome the lion and the bear. He was trusting in God's reputation. So quickly we forget about God's reputation. Isn't that true? When you face a problem, when you face something that you think you can't overcome, that we begin to worry and begin to doubt. We think, can we win the world? That's just impossible. No way. How are we going to do it? We don't have the resources. We don't have the manpower. We don't have what, you know, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Who are we serving? Let me ask you a few simple questions today. Has God provided for you up until now? Has he? That's not a hard question. Yes. Has God provided for other people that you know up until now? Hey, you know, can you remember 
Anytime when God did something incredible in your life that could only be explained by the power of God, how many's ever ever experienced something like that? Well, if that is the God you serve, why are you afraid of doing something incredible today for him? His reputation is sure. Your pastor asked him, you to make a commitment. He's praying for 500 people to make a commitment for $20 a week. Well, let's be honest. That's not much of a sacrifice. Is that true? I mean, let's be honest about it. I mean, we in the United States do not understand sacrifice. Is that fair to say? I mean, sacrifice to the American, and I don't mean to insult you. Please take it, understand my art. But sacrifice to an American generally is going through McDonald's, sorry, but uh, going through McDonald's and saying, no biggie fries today. <laughs> Just the normal size today, you know. I'm not going to upsize. Okay, yeah, I'm going to sacrifice. You know, I, I, I'm not a big fan of Oprah, but I remember this clip when she was interviewing Mother Teresa years ago. And Oprah said to Mother Teresa, she says, she says, yeah, all of us need to sacrifice. And Mother Teresa stops and looks at Oprah and says, you understand what sacrifice is. They went to commercial because <laughs> there is no way. I would say that even at our most difficult times in the United States, we're far better off than anybody else in the world. And that's nothing to be ashamed of or feel guilty about. We are blessed by God, but we are blessed for a purpose to get the gospel to the rest of the world. Trust God's reputation, not my own ability. I'll tell you a quick story. Our ministry has now taken our Filipino team to go into Pakistan to do uh, camps and evangelistic work in Pakistan. Now, I remember at the time when the gentleman from Pakistan came, the pastor, Pastor Irfan, came to me, and he said to me, he said, Greg, would you, would you take your evangelistic camp with me to Pakistan? And being the giant spiritual guy I am, I said, no, 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 I don't, that's not going to work. He says, oh, yeah, it'll work. I said, no, no, I don't, sorry, that's a whole different religion. I don't know, you know, and I, he says, no, 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 it'll work. I said, no, no, no. He says, oh, there's young people there. It works. Young people are young people. I'm like, no, 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 no. He says, you're afraid. I said, I am not afraid. Is it safe there? You know, you know? I mean. <laughs> He's like, why are you even asking me that? I said, I got to tell Luann something. I mean, what do you do? You wake up one day, tell your wife, hey, I'm going to go to Pakistan. You know, she's going to say, what's going on? You know, and he said this to me. He says, well, let me ask you a question. I said, okay. He says, are you in the will of God? Now, come on. That's like the nuclear question. What are you going to say? No, I'm blatantly out of the will of God. I mean, of course you're going to say yes. And I said, Yes, of course I'm in the will of God. He says, then why are you asking me if it's safe or whether you can go, or whether we work? Why don't you pray about it? Oh, man. Don't you, those kind of people, man, they just get you. And I'm like, oh. I said, okay, I'll pray about it. And frankly, I didn't need to pray about it. God opened the door. I should have just walked through. So he did. So he sends me the letter inviting me from the, the uh, Bible Baptist Church of Asad Kashmir, inviting Dr. Greg Lyons to do evangelistic work among youth. And he sends me this letter. He says, go apply for your visa. And I'm like, this will never fly. This is a hostile country. No, 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 no. They're not going to do it. He says, take it. We're not ashamed of anything. You take it in the embassy and get your visa. Okay. So I go in and I'm thinking, I'm never going. You know, they're not going to grant this. And the guy looks at it and says, you want to do what in my country? I said, listen, I'm just the guest. That's your citizen. Call him. Talk to him about it. There's his phone number, you know, and, and, and they start delaying our visas. We had five people that were going to go. And they kept delaying us, wanting additional stuff here and there, here and there, and all this kind of stuff. And uh, uh, I just almost given up hope that we were ever going to get a visa to get in. And so they, they called us one day and they said, hey, we need to look at your passports one more time. And uh, our secretary calls me and says, Pastor Greg, nobody can run these down to the, to the embassy. Can you do it? You've got, have you got any time today? And I said, yeah. Now, when we're saying run across town in Metro Manila, it's like what your pastor said. It's 28 million people. I mean, driving across town is a two-hour one-way, okay? 
And I thought, okay, so I'll jump in the car. So I went down there to our, show up at the, the building, they're in a high rise building, and I'm standing there after I checked in with the guard, and I'm going up to the eighth floor, and I had my passports in my hand, and all, all, the, all the group, and I'm waiting for the elevator. While I'm waiting for the elevator, on the back door of the building, an SUV pulls up, a black one, some guys hop out, open the door, a guy in a suit gets out, and he walks over and stands beside me, and he looks Pakistani to me, but I don't know who he is, you know? And so the, the elevator doors open up, and we walk in. And he says, what floor? I says, the eighth floor. He says, well, that's the Pakistani embassy. I said, yeah. He says, is that where you're going? I said, yeah. He said, because we have the whole floor. I said, I get it. Yeah, that's where I'm going. And I said, do you work there? He says, I'm the ambassador. I'm like, oh, God, slow the elevator down, you know? <laughs> and he says, uh, what are you doing at the embassy? I says, well, we're applying for visas. And he saw the five passports. And he says, oh, he says, uh, are, you, uh, are you a businessman? I said, kind of. You know, he says, you got business in Pakistan? I says, I don't know until I get there. I got to get my visa, you know. And he looked at the, he says, oh, you're that group. Are you the group that is applying to go to work with young people? And I said, yes, sir. That's us. I said, sir, I don't know if you can help us. I said, we're not going to do anything wrong. We're going to help the young people find hope and find, you know, help their moral values. We've done this in other countries, and we'd sure like to come to your country and present our program there. He looked at me and he said, can't promise anything, but I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll look at it again this afternoon. I said, good enough. Turned my, said him goodbye. He went into his office. I turned the passports in. The next day, five visas stamped in the passport. Short missionary visa. Can I tell you, God's reputation is pretty secure. He can do amazing things. He can arrange an elevator ride at the exact moment in a city of 28 million where it's just me and the ambassador to have a conversation that opens a door for the gospel. Our team went in and we have seen literally thousands of young people come to know Jesus Christ as a result of that moment. <laughs> Trust God's reputation, not my own ability. Third, use what God has given me now so let's pick up the story. David says to Saul that he killed the lion and the bear. David says in verse 37, moreover, David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. And so Saul clothed David with his armor and he put a bronze helmet on his head and also clothed him with a coat of mail. David fastened his sword and his armor and tried to walk for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these for I have not tested them. So David took them off. He took his staff in his hands and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook and put them in the shepherd's bag in a pouch in which he had and his sling was in his hand and he drew near to the Philistine. The principle is this, use what God has given me now. David didn't want the armor of Saul. It didn't fit him because God had already equipped him with the sling and prepared the stones for David to win the battle. Now, let me get a little personal here. A lot of people say they can't give to missions because, and they give whatever excuse they want. I'm going to wait till my kids get to college. I'm going to wait till this happens. I have to get my job, better job, whatever. You know, you know what? God has given you the ability to participate in the missions program of your church right now. You simply need to do it. Some people say, I could never be a missionary. I could never go on a mission trip because I'm not qualified or I don't have the right skill set or I don't know what to do and uh, I don't do well on planes or whatever excuse you want to you give there. And, and can, I, can I say that if God really wants you on the, on the mission field, if he wants you to be on a short-term mission trip or do an internship or do whatever that he wants you to do, he has already given you the skill set right now for you to accomplish what he wants you to do. You just have to embrace it. Let me give you another quick story. I was in a church in Raleigh, North Carolina at a dinner with some deacons and it was their missions month, same, same thing here and I was sitting around and uh, across the table from me was, uh, was the chief of police and another guy that worked for the state uh, FBI agency. And I was inviting them to come on a missions trip and both these guys said to me, they said, what are we gonna do on a trip? We're cops. I said, if you come, I will, I'll arrange some seminars for you to reach into the police community and we'll do that. Now, 
Honestly, I was blowing a little smoke, I'll have to say. You know, I'd never done that before, but I had faith, you know, and I knew some people, and I thought, if I can get them to come, I will make it happen. And sure enough, they took me up on my, prom, on my, my offer, and they came. Five of them came, and we held, event, we held law enforcement enhancement seminars all throughout Metro Manila. We were able to hold these seminars for 1,000 law enforcement officers. Over 400 got saved that day. It was amazing. I did not have the ability to speak into that community. They did. Among them was a sergeant named Roger Baltazar. He was a bad cop before he came to that seminar and heard the gospel from the life testimonies of those law enforcement officers that were there. And that day he came forward and he got saved. He enrolled in Bible college the next semester. He would, he would time his classes in between his shifts. He'd show up with his, with his uh, uniform on and his gun. All the other students really paid attention in the room, you know, while he was there. <laughs> he graduated four years later, valedictorian of his class. Unbelievable. When he graduated, we then elected a new president, our current president, Rodrigo uh, Duterte is his name. And Rodrigo Duterte, six years ago, decided to launch a war on drugs to eradicate drug usage and drug, the drug culture in the Philippines. And he made a decree and he said, we're going to come after you. We're going to arrest you. If you fight us, we're going to shoot you. I mean, it was very simple. And, and he said, so, but I'm going to give you a window uh, of two months for you to surrender. If you're in the drug culture and you want to surrender, we're going to give you a, a path to, to get it right. So come in. And, and, and boy, within two months, we had thousands of surrenderees that came out of the drug culture. The chief of police in this part of town met with his officers. Roger Baltazar was in the room. And he said this to his officers, we have a problem. All of these people that are surrendering, coming out of the drug culture and trying to change their life, all we can do is handle the legal side to this. We need help handling the moral side. What do we do with their families? How do we re-enter them into society? And, Rodri and Roger Baltazar, newly graduate, valedictorian of Baptist Bible College Asia, raises his hand and says, I have some answers. And the chief of police says, oh, yeah, aren't you like that pastor guy that went through that Bible? He says, yeah, yeah, that's me. Yeah. And he says, I know some pastors that can help. Three weeks later, at our church in Metro Manila, 700 drug surrenderees showed up at church on Saturday morning. Yes. They gave us free reign to say whatever we wanted, and we took advantage of it and preach the gospel, hundreds of them got saved. Their lives changed. We have been recognized by the city because we have, we, if people who come through our program has the lowest recept, re, recidivism rate of anybody else that is involved in that, and it has helped us throughout our entire ministry, all because I had dinner with a couple of cops and convinced them to use what God had given them now for the gospel. I don't know what God has given you, but I know he's given you something. Maybe you come to Asia and you work with us and we do an English camp. How many of you speak English? <laughs> You're qualified, okay, you know. One guy came from Texas. He was teaching everybody how, you know, how to say y'all and how to say cattle. And I said, could we get a little better English speaker, you know, uh, for our guys? He was willing to be used. Maybe you like children, maybe you have a medical skill, maybe you have a dental skill, maybe you have an education skill, but God has equipped you for the nations. Right now, in this room, there are people that could help change the world if you would just embrace what David did and use what God has given me now. Lastly, not only see opportunity when others see danger, not only trust God's reputation and not my own ability, not only use what God has given me now, but lastly, keep moving when the battle gets hot. Notice what David says in verse 43 to 50. So the Philistine said to David, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? 
And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beast of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword, with a spear, with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. This day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and, and wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Verse 48, and so it was when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, and David hurried and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. Keep moving when the battle gets hot. I'm going to tell you, if you commit to giving missions to the Lord, I'm not going to promise you that everything will be wonderful after you make the commitment. It's very likely you would go through some hard times. And will you quit or will you keep moving when the battle gets hot? If you say, I want to use myself for the Lord, I want to offer myself, my skill set, whatever it is, to be used on a missions trip and used on, on, as a missionary or used as an intern or something, or do something even in this church if, if, if that's necessary, you're going to hit a wall where, where Satan's going to try to discourage you and stop you, and it will be a test. It's the same test that David faced on the battlefield, and it will be your choice to keep moving when the battle gets hot. Sometimes I think we have Christians that are so weak that a little problem causes us to stop serving God. I think it's time for us to say to the devil, not today. You're not taking me out of the battle today. Have you ever witnessed to somebody and they said this to you? They said, yeah, you can be my friend, and, you know, but I'm not going to talk about religion and politics. You ever had somebody say that to you? You know what I say? Sorry. That doesn't work for me. <laughs> yeah. You know, frankly, I believe in Jesus. So, yes, I will talk to you about Jesus. So, if our friendship is based on my silence about Jesus, you're going to have to tolerate me as a friend because sooner or later, I'm going to tell you about Jesus. I'm not willing to be taken out of the game just by somebody saying that to me. And I think that we need to say to, our, to, to the devil, no, you're not going to take me out to the game. I'm a David. I've got faith like David. Throw the Goliath in front of me. That's okay. I'll run and fight him and I'll conquer him in the name of Jesus Christ because I have the faith of David. You have that kind of faith. You can go Goliath. You don't have to go home. The question today is, do you want to make a dent or do you want to make a difference? Now, let me just give you a little bias that I have. I have a map up here of Asia that we're going to show in a minute. And it has a circle of, of the population of the world. And the, the, the circle is, is around Asia. It's from Japan all the way to Pakistan. Over half of the world lives within that circle. There is such a great need. Why am I in Metro Manila? Because it's in the middle of that circle. It is a time for us to reach into that circle. Why am I here and why have I come to Anchorage Baptist Temple? I am on a mission. I am on a mission to help you engage in world evangelism to make a difference in our world. The gospel was never given to us just to hold and sit in a pew in church, but the gospel and the message of Jesus was given to us so that we can cascade it throughout all the world. And it's time to do that do you have the faith of David it's time to get a little personal here and ask yourself are you living like David I mean you letting danger shut you down a little fear slow you down have you been for, have you forgotten about God's powerful reputation that he can in fact empower you to do unbelievable things I want to end with one story Years ago, God moved our ministry out of a place that was very comfortable that I was happy with, and he moved us to a place that I didn't want to be. You ever, you ever followed God where, you know, you kind of followed God kicking and screaming? Anybody ever done that? Yeah, God, I, I prayed, I wanted you to move, and then you moved me here. I didn't really want to move here, okay. But you, you, you kind of ended up there. So I prayer walked the area. 
found the Rizal High School. The Rizal High School, a huge high school, I mentioned it before, 42,000 teenagers in one high school. It's unbelievable. Nobody was reaching into this high school. And so we wanted to get into this high school and present the gospel. And so um, I, I, I went to, to uh, see the, the mayor and the governor and get permission to take our program into the high school and they granted us. And then I went to see the principal of the high school. Now, just so I know who I'm talking to, how many's ever been in the principal's office? Okay, some of you more than once, okay. Uh, imagine going to see the principal of the largest high school on the planet. Who would want to be the principal of the largest high school on the planet? You know, is one thought I had. And I went in there and, and uh, I, I said, we'd like to bring our program. It's a drug and violence prevention program and we'd like to offer it to the students to help the students and, and there. And she looked at me and she says, well, I already know who you are. And I said, oh, really? She says, yeah, you're the pastor of this little Baptist church down the road here. I've been watching you, I saw your sign. I said, okay. She says, and I don't want you on my school. I know you. And you have different motives. You're not here just to do drug and violence prevention. You have other motives. She was right, okay? I, yes, I want to get the gospel. She said, well, I'm not going to let you do what you want to do. She says, I will give you a chance to have a rally, but it won't be for any students that are in class. It'll be any students that come early for class. Now, teenagers, they're rushing, you know, to school for a drug prevention program, you know, <laughs> two hours before school. They love it, you know. And, and I said, what about, they had two shifts, they had a morning shift and an evening shift. I said, what about the students in the, in, in the morning shift? Uh, she said, you can have another one at the end of the day, and that's if any kids want to stay after school to go to your drug prevention rally. <laughs> and I thought, oh, she's shutting us down. She wouldn't let us promote, she said she would promote us, and I thought, this is a fail. I said, man, we're not gonna win on this. And I walked out of that office. I had Pastor June Mastralis with me, and we were walking down the sidewalk, and I. My, I was shaking. I don't know what you think about missionaries. We're just normal people. We just do our thing in a different culture, different language, different place. And I was just shaking my head, thinking this is a wash, this is a fail. But I began to think that, you know, the, really the problem was that it wasn't God, it was this principle. She was in the way. She was in the way of the gospel. She was shutting us down. So I turned to Pastor June. I said, you know this woman? He said, yeah. I said, she's, she's in the way. He said, yeah, she's in the way of the gospel. He said, yeah, yeah, she is. I said, you know what we're going to do? He said, what? I said, we're going to pray. He said, okay, we're going to pray. What are we going to pray? I said, we're going to pray that God will just take her out of the way. <laughs> he said, okay. So we began to pray. Pray that God would just move her. And my brother was across town. He, he began to pray. It wasn't some strategic global prayer movement. Okay, no, it was just some Christians praying. Well, months went by and we were supposed to have the rally on June the 8th or January the 8th, right after New Year. And we went there, showed up early for the rally and, and started setting up our sound system and everything. And I sent word over to the principal's office and we had a plaque. I had a plaque for her saying, thank you for letting us do this. Even if it was gonna be a fail, I thought no, there's always next year. Somebody comes over and says, well, the, the principal's not here. And I said, I understand it's early in the morning. When she gets here, have her come over. So, so I sent the guy back. She, guy comes back with another teacher and she says, yeah, the principal is not here. I said, yeah, I get it. But when she gets here, you know, we got this plaque for her and everything like that. And she says, no, you don't understand. She is not here. She's no longer here. I said, what do you mean? She says, she retired January 1st, eight days ago. <laughs> mm, all right, God, you know. I said, what are you? She said, well, I'm the interim principal. I said, that's great. I said, do you know this was this program we're having? She said, yeah, she told us we're not supposed to dismiss any students, do you? I said, I get that, I get that. You're the interim principal? Yeah, are you being considered to be the next principal? Yeah, who makes that decision? She says, the mayor and the governor. I says, did you know the mayor and the governor endorsed this program? And we want to make sure that you, will you come? She says, I'll come. I said, well, we want you here. We want you, we have our photographer here. We're going to get pictures of the success or failure of this rally that the governor and the mayor <laughs> endorsed who are making the decision about the next principal that you're applying for. And we want to make sure that you're in the picture so we can see the empty room and we're going to get it all, you get the plaque and everything. And she says, I understand, I understand. <laughs> Two hours later, 2,000 students were dismissed to the rally. That afternoon, another 2,000 students were dismissed to the rally. It was God's hand. You might say, well, that happens to missionaries. Yes, it does happen to missionaries, but it can happen to you too, if you'll have the faith of David. Will you have the faith of David? We're trying to reach a city of 28 million in Metro Manila. 
another city of 4 million in Phnom Penh, Cambodia, another city of 10 million in Bangkok, Thailand. And God is opening up so many doors. It's an opportunity for you to have a part in that. Would you bow your heads for a minute? Maybe you're here today and you would say, Greg, I need that kind of faith. I need the faith of David. I need to go Goliath. I don't know what has been holding you back in your faith to do amazing things for God, but whatever it has been, overcome it today. See opportunity when others see danger. Trust God's reputation and not your own ability. Use what God has given you now. And don't stop when the battle gets hot. Hey everybody, Pastor Ron here. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Here at ABT, we make a big deal about following Jesus. Make sure that you subscribe and hit our notification bell so that you don't miss any of our upcoming video content. Also, if you'd like to support this ministry, please click donate now. Thanks for watching.